We're going to have a little circuit fun today. Uh, this time looking at this 5 transistor ESR meter circuit that was designed by uh, EEV blog user J Diddy B. And uh, I love this circuit. It's, uh, I think it, there's some really clever things that are going on in here. And I thought it might make a really good subject for uh, my circuit fun video today. So we've got the uh, circuit built up on the breadboard here. We're going to break the circuit down uh, bit by bit so you can understand how it works. We'll take a look at uh, all of the measurements. We'll even compare how well it works compared to uh, the ESR meter that I designed uh, and built uh, about 10 years ago. So uh, anyway, sit back and enjoy. Let's have a little circuit fun. Now the circuit as presented on the EEV blog forum used a meter movement that was 50 microamps full scale. Now the only meter movement that I had here that met that requirement is the meter that's inside my Simpson 260. And I thought, why don't we use that? It's got a nice big display and I won't have to alter the design to work with one of the other meters I have. So that's what we're going to use to show the response of this circuit. Now this design gives you a nice expanded non-linear scale of ESR uh, resistance readings just like uh, my original design did. But since I didn't take the time to draw up a new scale for this meter, Let's start essentially at the end and make some comparison measurements of uh, measured uh, accurate readings of ESR and where they land on this meter so we get an idea of what that scale looks like. So we'll start off by zeroing both of them. If I take uh, my original design and I'll uh, zero that scale out right there. And we'll take the five transistor design and connect this guy up to ground here and uh, zero out that scale as well. Now the scales aren't going to be the same, so let's start off by making some uh, known resistance measurements. So if I hook uh, my meter up to, say, a 3.3 ohm resistor, we can kind of see that that's lining right up between the 3 and the 4 hash mark that I kind of put on my meter here. So I know that's a good about 3.3 uh, ohms. So now let's take a look at where that's going to read with this 5 transistor design. So 3.3 ohms on this scale is going to be just a little bit below half scale. Uh, if we double that to 6.6 .6 ohms, that's going to be at about uh, a quarter of the scale. And if we measure, say, a 10 ohm resistor, that's going to be, you know, about 20% uh, of the scale. And uh, I've got a very low resistance here. This uh, piece of nichrome wire here to this bend is about a half an ohm. So we can say a half an ohm is going to be, you know, about 80-85% uh, of the scale here for a half an ohm. So we can see that, so we're about a half an ohm, about three, about six, about ten. That's about what our scale is going to be on the five transistor design. Okay, a couple of quick comparisons on some actual capacitors. Here's a 220 microfarad cap that is uh, known good. And if I connect it up to my meter, we can see that reads pretty darn close to zero. It's probably, uh, you know, it's certainly well under one ohm well under even a half an ohm of ESR. Let's take that same capacitor and connect it up to the five transistor design here. Hook it up here and touch ground on the other side here and we can see that that thing's pretty close to zero. So we know for this known good capacitor uh, the readings basically match. So here's a known bad uh, capacitor. Let's take a look at it on uh, my original ESR meter and see that one's showing oh between oh about six ohms maybe a little bit more than six ohms of resistance or ESR let's hook it up to the five transistor design here and see what it reads there and that's about where we saw the six ohms of resistance uh, on this scale so we know the ESR meter works and basically matches the results of uh, the design that I did ten years ago again I love this circuit so I think it's worth going in and let's see how it works all right, well, first, let's take a block diagram view of the circuit here. Uh, a voltage regulator to give a regulated 5 volts uh, supply uh, to the circuit. Uh, then we've got this very interesting uh, oscillator circuit we're going to look at first. So that oscillator is essentially driving a resistive bridge. Both sides of that bridge are being essentially amplified by a match set of common emitter amplifiers. And then the difference voltage between the outputs of the common emitter amplifiers is what's used to drive the meter. So here's the basic theory of operation. 
we've got a square wave coming out of the oscillator here and being driven onto the top of this resistive bridge. If we don't have a capacitor here, then the voltages appearing midway down either side of the bridge should be identical. Those voltages are amplified by these identical common emitter amplifiers so that the output of those common emitter amplifiers are basically going to be the same. So the difference voltage them between them is zero, so no current flows through the meter. Now consider what happens when we place a capacitor with a low ESR between the test points. That's effectively going to be an AC short and essentially uh, short the signal coming from the oscillator to ground. Therefore, nothing gets coupled through this capacitor and the output of this amplifier is just going to be essentially a DC value. However, the signal on the other side of the bridge is unaffected by that capacitor, so it's still going to couple into this amplifier and the output of this amplifier is still going to move up and down. Now we do have a voltage difference between these two amplifiers and that's what this meter circuit is going to uh, read. So the two extremes are if there's no capacitor sitting here, these voltages are identical, therefore the swing at the output of both these amplifiers is identical, thus no voltage ac appears across this meter reading circuit so we don't see any deflection on the meter. The other extreme is when we've got a very low ESR capacitor here that effectively shorts the signal out. This signal doesn't move at all, it's just a DC value, and we get a full swing here, and we adjust the uh, trimmer to get full scale reading on the meter. Now, of course, any ESR between, you know, effectively zero and open circuit is going to just cause a small amount of that signal to appear. Uh, at this amplifier output, thus reducing the amount of voltage difference and thereby giving us something a little bit less than the full scale reading. And that's how this ESR meter works. So let's uh, take a look at uh, you know, some waveforms within the circuit to kind of get a better idea of how all this is put together. The first sub-circuit we'll take a look at is the oscillator. And it's actually a, quite a clever, interesting little circuit. It's known as a, an emitter coupled A-stable multivibrator and it operates a little bit like a relaxation oscillator. So let's take a look at how it works. I've got it uh, instrumented up here on the scope. So channel 1 is probing the collector of Q2. Um, channel 2, the light uh, blue trace here, is probing the emitter of Q1. And uh, the purple trace, channel 3, is probing the emitter of Q2. So let's consider what happens at power up. Uh, so at power up, uh, the voltage at the base of Q1 is going to go to about mid rail. Remember, all the capacitors are not charged yet, so there's no voltage across C2. Uh, so um, what's going to happen now is the base of Q2 comes up uh, because the power came up. The emitter is going to come up as well, and that's going to also drag along the emitter of Q1 because the voltage on this capacitor can't change instantaneously. And that's going to keep Q1 turned off. And but if Q1 is turned off, that means its collector voltage is going to be near the supply rail. That turns on Q2 very hard, and in fact it saturates Q2. And we can see that on the scope plots. Uh, the collector voltage is coming down, the emitter voltage is coming up, and we can see the collector and emitter voltage are very close to each other, indicating that Q2 is in saturation. Okay, so right after that happens, uh, the, there's going to be a voltage across R5, therefore there's going to be some current flowing through R5, and that's going to cause the voltage on this side of C2 to drop, thereby starting to charge up C2. And we can see that happening right here. This is the voltage that appears at the emitter of Q1. We can see that voltage now dropping. Now eventually that voltage drops far enough for uh, Q1 to turn on. As soon as Q1 turns on, its collector voltage gets yanked down. When that happens, Q2 turns off. And we can see that happens right here. Uh, we get down to the point where Q1 turns on. Uh, that uh, immediately turns off Q2. We can see its collector voltage rise up. And, uh, and now we're beginning the charge cycle in the other direction. Okay, so since Q2 is turned off, there's no current coming out of its emitter. Uh, so therefore there's nothing to keep putting charge onto this capacitor, so now resistor R7 starts discharging the voltage across C2, and that voltage here begins to drop. And we can see that happening right here. So now that uh, emitter voltage of Q2 drops to the point where Q2 eventually turns on again, 
And then you get a little bit of a regenerative action. As Q2 turns on, that provides a little bit of a bump to the voltage at the emitter of Q1, causing it to turn off slightly, which causes the collector voltage to raise up, which turns that on harder, and this thing rege regeneratively resets back to that original condition again, as if the power had just turned on, and then the process starts all over again. So it's a pretty nifty uh, oscillator circuit, and uh, one that uh, you don't run across very often, so I thought it was interesting to take a look at. Okay, so we've got our uh, oscillator uh, being uh, buffered essentially and amplified again by uh, Q3, driving the top of our bridge circuit. Uh, the bridge uh, is driving the input of these two uh, identical common emitter amplifiers. So let's take a look now at the effect of the output of those amplifiers with different load or in the test capacitor socket. Okay, so I've got uh, the two probes uh, sitting at the collectors of Q4 and Q5, the, uh, the outputs of these two common emitter amplifiers. And with nothing connected to the test points, we can see that those two outputs are virtually the same, so the voltage difference between them is really essentially zero, or very close to zero. Now, of course, if we take and short that uh, test point to ground, as would be the case with a, a, ver a good capacitor, we can see that the collector voltage of Q4 is nearly DC. It doesn't change very much at all, but the collector of Q5 is varying quite a bit. And it's that voltage difference that is measured by this circuit. You'll notice if we put a different amount of resistance in, say a half an ohm, we can see now there's a smaller voltage difference here because there's a little bit of a swing going on on the collector here. We go to a larger resistance value like 3 ohms. Now we can see that the voltage difference is getting less, so there's going to be less uh, voltage for this meter circuit to measure. And we get all the way to the point where it's open circuit and those two voltages match again. So let's consider the case where we've got a, a pretty good capacitor sitting here and we have essentially near DC uh, sitting at the collector of Q4. That's kind of the purple trace here. Now the collector of Q5 is moving up and down above and below that value. When it swings above that value, uh, we're going to couple the signal through this capacitor, through diode D3, and start charging up Q5. So with a voltage uh, on Q5, we're going to now see a current that's flowing down through the resistors in the meter, and we're going to uh, see a deflection on the meter. Now when the voltage on the collector swings down below the voltage on the collector here. Diode D3 turns off, but diode D4 turns on. And essentially we're going to get the current that flows this way through the diode, putting a charge on C7, positive and negative here, or I should say this voltage higher than this one. Uh, but the, we're still just going to see this meter reading current that's being bled off of C5. So now this C7 has been charged this way, so when this voltage raises back up again, that charge then gets transferred from D3 back onto C5 again. So regardless of whether this is swinging positive or negative, we're going to just essentially be adding charge on C5 in one direction, therefore we're going to see a uh, current deflection only in one direction. So essentially the voltage on uh, this side of our meter circuit is uh, the purple trace here. I'm going to stick the probe uh, right here at essentially test point four, uh, and we can actually see there that that voltage is now consistently above uh, the voltage that's sitting uh, down here, indicating we've essentially got a DC uh, with small variations, but essentially DC sitting across that meter, thus we've got uh, current flow in only one direction. So hats off to EEV blog user J Diddy B for a really clever and interesting 5 transistor ESR meter circuit. I hope you enjoyed going through it with me and exploring some of the details of some of the clever little circuits like this uh, Astable oscillator and the interesting arrangement of uh, these matched uh, common emitter amplifiers and uh, a way of turning the differential voltage between them into a DC current to read on the meter. Anyway, thanks again for watching. If you like what you see, certainly give me a thumbs up if you haven't subscribed already, please do so. Uh, comments are always welcome, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.